In the previous episode, I started my dive into the game submitted to RGCD's 2019 Commodore 64 16K cartridge game development competition, looking at the first half of the 20 games submitted. It's still a mouthful of a title, but that's the sign of something that is truly exciting to experience. So if you haven't caught that video, you may want to watch it before you watch this final part, which covers the last 10 games submitted, alongside my personal picks and recommendations. So let's go. This is Beyond the Scanlines, a series focusing on interesting games on classic computing and gaming platforms. The first of the games in this second half is Georg Rottensteiner's Pocket Dungeon, a self-described tiny dungeon role, in which you must navigate a procedurally generated dungeon, aiming to locate a particular trinket, then getting the heck out of dodge with it in your grubby mitts. Each level you explore is played out over a single screen, and as with any dungeon, it's filled with meanies. Plenty of them. Engaging them in battle is as simple as bumping into them to make an attack. Of course, they'll reciprocate in kind, and as always with these games, surviving them is making sure you give yourself plenty of distance and time your attacks just right. Starting out though, as is usually the case with this style of game, it can be quite the punishing experience. In fact, I kind of found it a little too punishing because I found myself frequently being slaughtered by some of the lower level creeps. It's not helped because of the way the rooms are generated, as sometimes they'll take up tiny areas of the available screen real estate, which means you could be a little constrained too much for my liking. The presentation keeps the simplistic side of things with a simple title screen alongside your status details displayed. Considering the nature of this kind of game, I think that's a fair move considering Something which is more important is really the AI, room generation, and details. So all up, Pocket Dungeon is an interesting attempt at this style of game within the limits of the competition. That overall, it's one where my experiences meant that whilst I really wanted to enjoy it, I found it a little too challenging to really put some time into it. Next up, we've got Relentless 64, a game developed by Bitplane Technomantes. Relentless 64 is obviously a C64 adaptation of a game originally developed for the Amstrad CPC as part of a similar contest back in 2013. And knowing the original coder is on board with this and is actually responsible for the code, you know it's going to be special indeed. Mechanics wise, Relentless is very much focused on scoring, specifically chaining combos as long as you can. As each formation enters the screen, you'll have to wipe them out in order to increase this. If you let a single enemy escape, this will be reset to its base amount and you'll have to do it all over again. Now of course, running into the scenery also knocks this back along with taking out one of your lives in the process. Those aren't your only threats though. The levels do contain plenty of emplacements which are ready to line up and take an unwary player out. There are plenty of high points here, ranging from the mechanics, as I've discussed, to the presentation containing a Petsky-based front end, which is really quite a joy to look at. This carries on with the rest of the visuals, also containing a very unique style amongst the proceedings derived from this Petsky front end, and most importantly, it's all backed up by an absolutely marvellous soundtrack, which really, really adds a great sense of intensity to the proceedings. Something else I quite appreciated was the front end options. Being able to toggle the difficulty is quite a neat feature. As things get harder, the gameplay will change in both the ferocity of the turrets alongside your own auto fire ability. Ratchet it all the way up to hard and you're going to need to hammer that fire button down, furiously in fact, in order to get as many shots down as possible. But on the easier levels, you do have a degree of auto fire which allows that beginning player to ease into the patterns of the game. Relentless is absolutely the right name to use with this shooter. It's well polished, excellently executed, and one you can be seriously engaged with when battling through its many, many levels. The second submission from the team over at Digital Monastery is Robots Rumble, yet another conversion which originated on the Humble ZX Spectrum. The task here is simply to lead a number of robots into burning lava. It's not the most environmentally friendly method of disposing them, but considering the obstacles you'll face on route, it's quite a better option for sure. Because 
you don't just get to hurl them into the lava to dispose of them. Instead, you've got a pair of magnets at your control, one located on each edge of the screen. So you'll be moving those magnets up and down to pull a robot in a given direction. It may sound simple, but it can be a good challenge in trying to send those robots into their fiery deaths. Because the hazards, and there are plenty of them, include kryptonite stones, which trigger the release of catastrophic amounts of pollution. But they're sentinel units, and plenty more in the way. Things are more complicated by the addition of limited battery power for your magnets. So if you run out of power, or you send a robot into one of these obstacles, you're going to lose a robot, and when all of those are lost, it's game over. Control-wise, you have support for both joystick and keyboard controls. Whilst the joysticks are an option, personally, for the sake of coordination, I think the keyboard works much, much better here. Befitting a game originally off the spectrum, the presentation is clear and simple, offering clear visuals using the high-resolution graphics modes alongside some bold colour choices. As for the audio, the music sounds great, though I'm not 100% sure it entirely fits the game. Doubly so when, well, it's a cover of a famous pop tune. All Up Robots Rumble is a game which is quite engaging and challenging, and certainly a unique approach to puzzle games, which really has a great place amongst the other submissions in this contest. Next up, we've got Space Orbs, the next release from Team Space Moguls. The concept here is that you manage a pair of ships in orbit, and they're tasked with clearing out a group of space orbs before they reach the surface of the planet, causing great devastation to everyone around them. Clearing them out requires you to match them up in groups of three or more, and so this is done by grabbing orbs from one side of the playfield and throwing them across to the other player's area. Like any other puzzle game, there is time pressure with the rows descending over time if they're not cleared out. To seriously get the best out of space orbs, you'll want to have a friend join in, with you each taking charge of one of the ships. This way, you can work together in bouncing orbs between either side of the screen to clear them out much, much quicker. If, like me, you're playing this solo, there are plenty of ways to play it with a single joystick, and whilst it doesn't quite work as well as I'd imagine it would in two-player, it does make a serviceable enough game. Now, this is really what makes this game as a unique entry into the competition. Most of the games we've seen so far are really only playable by a single person, but Space Orbs really needs to have that friend in order to make it most enjoyable. It's got to be said, this is also a bit of a rougher experience compared to some of the other games, especially compared to Nono Pixies, the other Space Moguls developed game. But it's still quite special to enjoy, especially if you have a friend on board. I wish there was a bit more done to it for the sake of the contest, but reading up the development blog, you'll notice it was one that had a bit of a tricky development process. That being said, it's still worth checking out. Stercore XD marks the second entry from the crew over at C64 CD Labs, who are also responsible for Death Weapon, which was featured in the previous episode. Stercore just happens to be its predecessor, as here you're in charge of a garbage scout when the repugnant swamp invade Stercore 64, an artificial world used as a deep space refueling point. Mechanically, this offers a bit of a pared back experience. It really just boils down to blasting things, blasting everything that moves. One thing you'll have to adapt to compared to other shooters is that the environment is just for show. Unlike many other shooters, you can pass over it or behind it without risk of losing one of your lives. Something else I kind of dig is that instead of spawning as groups of enemies in a formation pattern, your threats spawn in randomly. It's a simple twist, but it adds a degree of unpredictability that truly keeps you on your feet. There is plenty of colour and detail to the backgrounds, or should I say backgrounds and foregrounds, because as is the case here, you'll be flying both on top of and behind elements of the station's superstructure, which is another neat twist on the visual side of things. The sprites are also very clear amongst this all, and whilst you might find yourself not quite prepared for stages with foreground elements, I do find it contributes quite nicely to stopping you going outright into autopilot as you play through the game. That being said, like Death Weapon, there's not a lot of depth to the mechanics on offer, but once again, it comes together as a nice blasting experience. 
what I strangely felt was kind of chilled out once you give it a few plays. Now onto Misfits Super Goatron. With a name like that, you can't help but feel there might be a bit of a of that mint of magic here, and you know, it's actually there, in some spirit at least. Within each of the stages, your goal is to just blast the targets. But weirdly enough, there aren't a huge number of them, and whilst it may make it sound straightforward, I can tell you something, it is anything but. Your craft is fixed to the edge of the screen, starting with the ability to move left or right, but you've also got the ability to teleport to the opposing edge, which takes a brief moment of time to accomplish. There's also an extra trick here, the ability to thrust off the wall. When used right, this allows you to move over certain level obstacles and even position yourself on the side walls of the stage. As for those obstacles, they're mostly comprised of walls. Now some of those are shootable, kind of like the shielding in Space Invaders. Others though, they'll reflect your shots right back at you and if you're not careful or ready for it, things can go terribly wrong. The levels also feature turrets. For the most part, taking these out is optional, though for some stages, you'll be required to take them out as well. Thankfully though, you've got firepower upgrades. They'll help you clear things out. Even better, if you get shot and lose a life, they're not taken away. It's a small thing, but one so very, very appreciated. It's not as frenetic a shooter as some of the other titles in the combo but I really dig how it plays around with its mechanics and still offers a tense challenge as you battle against the clock to beat each stage. Super Gotron absolutely shows how a simple mechanic with a few twists here and there can be just as pulse pounding as other more frenetic games, with quite the engaging set of mechanics to boot. Swarm is a game which comes to us from Comocore, and if anything can certainly be expected, it's the most unique entry submitted. Because Swarm is a full-on real-time strategy game. Your task here is to explore the known sector and try to find asteroids which must be colonized before your enemy does the same and wipes you out. Like with any other strategy game, you'll start out with a single asteroid as your base of operations, which you've got to mine for resources and use to construct craft which you'll send out on scouting and attack missions. You'll need these missions to both locate further asteroids to mine, but also to defend your own holdings against enemy attacks. Now, of course, there's always going to be those moments where success demands you must take the fight to the enemy, which is really where this game gets its name, because you can get to the point where you could be in command of up to 100 individual craft. Of course, though, the same can be said for the enemy. The concept and the design make for an incredibly interesting game, but when it comes to actually playing it, I think things fall down a bit there in comparison. I found it quite easy to lose track of craft as because of the space environments, you don't really have anything which could be considered a landmark for tracking. Sure, you've got a coordinate system displayed at the bottom of the screen, but it still could be very easy to get lost, especially when you can only reference your asteroids that you're mining as target positions on the map. If anything, Swarm has to be celebrated for the accomplishment of squeezing a complex action strategy game into the limits of this competition. At the end of the day though, I truly wish it was one that could be expanded out and refined further. Not only because we don't have many of these kinds of strategy games on the C64, but also because it's one which has a lot, and I mean a lot of potential to be something far greater and far more intuitive than what we have here. The last of the releases from the Digital Monastery crew, and yet again it's a conversion of another ZX Spectrum game developed by the Mojong Twins. In Tenebrae Macabre, you play the Time Mistress Mega Megan, now locked inside the crypts of Alicante. Your goal is simply to escape, which is done by lighting all of the candles you encounter along the way. This might sound simple enough, except for one particular thing. Until you light up the candle in each room, you'll be exploring it in near total darkness. Sure, the immediate area around you is lit up a bit, and you do have occasional thunderstorms which briefly illuminate the room, but for the most part, you'll be doing your exploring in pitch black darkness. Now that is where the challenge comes in. 
you'll need to move about carefully, and I mean very carefully, in order to avoid running into enemies or traps as you search for the candle within each room. Not only do they light things up, but every fourth one you do light up will earn you an extra life as well, which, let's face it, is going to come in very handy. Now, as with Lala Prologue, it comes across quite nicely from the original source material. Prior to lighting up each room, there is some seriously moody visuals, alongside great use of the C64's color palette in illuminating the area around your character. The effect of the lightning flashes also works nicely here in achieving the same, briefly inverting the screen colors in the process. And of course, no surprise to see the audio is quite atmospheric too, with some very responsive controls to boot. Admittedly, I got along with this better than I did with Lala Prologue, but I'm not gonna lie, I do share similar feelings than I did with that game. It's well polished, well executed, and a nice game to in fact play, but personally it's just that bit too frustrating for me to enjoy. Once again, it's one I can respect, and I do think you should check it out, especially if you have different opinions on these kind of games than I do. If there was an award for the oddest game submitted to the contest, it would no doubt have to go to The Royal Hunt, a game developed by Bimba Lade. As a king who's been a little too fond of hunting the local boar population, the time has finally come for the boar kind to have their revenge. The goal here is simple. Simple survival. Well, that and escaping your estate, of course. But the king is completely stark naked, with no protection at all to hand. Meanwhile, the boars are now armed to the teeth, in a pure reversal of what came before. You'll now need to navigate your way through your hedge maze, one which is randomly generated, learning to outwit the boars and get to the end without being shot. Of course, as you make your way through each room, the boars will appear, training their gun sights on you. As with any gauntlet you may run through, it's really about being swift on your feet, but also knowing when to stop. The boar's guns can aim in any of eight directions, so knowing where to wait until the coast is clear is truly paramount. The downside is that there can be points where you feel a little trapped, as you could be in a position where you think you might be clear to make your move, but a surprise boar can end your run in a snap. The visuals are colourful and detailed, offering clear separation into places you can run, and the hedge walls where you need to be crafty as you make your move. Like many other games, the level is made up from a bunch of pre-generated rooms, and after a few plays, you'll start to see them dotted about more and more. For a game like this, smooth controls are essential, and they're put together quite well here, feeling responsive and easily do the job. All up, the Royal Hunt offers a slightly surreal concept and a fun, if slight, challenge. Plus, out of all the entries submitted, it's the most 2019 of them all. And if that can't beat back the existential despair of 2019, even for a short while, then I don't know what really can. And now, now we've reached the final submitted entry to the contest, Mike Richmond's Vegetables. Once again, it's another puzzle game, though this time it comes inspired by classic Match 3 titles where the objective is to line up a group of three items to clear them from the board. Much like with Nono Pixie, I truly appreciate that this is a rather chilled experience. Many Match 3 games on other platforms introduce time limits and combo chains, and they add some serious pressure for those who aren't already experienced enough in recognising the patterns which you'll need here to succeed. The joystick controls work great in navigating the grid and selecting which tile to move about, and it features some satisfying results when a match is found. Even more so when you make a move resulting in a chain of them happening. Whilst you need to match three tiles to clear them off the board, if you're skillful enough to match four, you can clear out an entire row or column from the board. The challenge does ramp up though by the introduction of fixed tiles to the board. You can't move these ones around, so they'll start to limit your options as they start appearing later in the game. All up, this was a fun, enjoyable puzzler to play through. The only real issue I had was that at least with my setup when recording, the graphics were a little too cramped for my liking, leaving a lot of screen real estate unused. If you're the type of person who has their C64 a lot closer to the TV than I do, 
it probably won't be as much of a problem in comparison. And that is all the entries which make up the submission to RGCD's 2019 16K cartridge development competition. The quality level this year has certainly been up there, and whilst there are a few which I personally didn't enjoy all that much, there were others which were good fun, and certainly a few surprises amongst them all. So before I talk about my top five games, why don't I go through a few honorable mentions. Firstly, attempting to cram a full strategy game into the confines of a 16k cartridge is certainly quite a challenge, and the result with Swarm is something which really needs to be tried out. Whilst I didn't find it the most friendly experience to get into, I think there absolutely is an experience which is worth building upon, and with more polish and work, it could be something which stands out in offering more depth than your average C64 release. I certainly do hope the coders of this one do choose to build upon it some more. My other honourable mention goes to Out of Ink. Let's focus on more technical platforming, alongside the way it mutates another game, the indie release Ink, which makes its own game, though challenging and a more technical experience, really makes for something I know that personally I want to sit down with some more. But now onto my top five. At number five, it's Nono Pixie. One thing I've been finding myself really craving more lately is more chilled experiences, games where I can sit back, work through them at my own pace, and, and not feel I have to compete with others. The way Nono Pixie manages its level progression with the freedom to start at any level you choose and play with or without a timer means that I can enjoy its array of puzzles without truly feeling overwhelmed. Its atmosphere provides a great chilled experience and makes for a wonderful take on the nonogram puzzler for our trusty machine. On to number four, and my pick here is Relentless 64. If you've been a long time viewer of the channel, you know that I'm quite the shooter fan. Whilst the C64 is a great machine technically for shooters, there are plenty of classics, at least as others call them in the genre, which I've always felt have lacked design and could have had a bit more work done to them. There are also a lot of shooters on the C64 that are purely about blasting and not really about a challenging scoring system to max up your score. So these are things which Relentless brings to the table that offers something fresh and unique. Alongside this, the presentation and its soundtrack make for a killer combination. It's a shooter which is quite a welcome release on the C64, especially if you're a fan and you want something a little different in the mechanics, instead of just blasting endless waves of threats. For number three, it's Dice Skater. I truly, truly love what this offered in terms of being an arcade style gaming experience, which is easy to learn, but tough to master. It's polished to the max, and there is a solid old school challenge as a result. And I really feel that this ramping of the mechanics makes for a fun experience and one that you can get a lot out of with a bit of play. Coming up to number two, and it's Dot Cosmos. As I mentioned in the first part of the video, I know that amongst folks, there are some who think the platformer is overrated on the trusty C64. Personally though, I quite enjoy the way Dot Cosmos works with its core mechanics between the two differing time periods. Knowing which is needed at a certain point really makes for a great challenge, especially with the constraints in knowing that you've got to conserve your charge for shifting periods as long as you can. It's a well-polished experience, incredibly fun to play, and certainly has me quite excited for its sequel, which is coming down the line. And finally, my top pick of the competition, and you should not be surprised to, for me to mention that it's Neutron. It may not lack the spark of originality that some of the other games offered in this contest, but it's one where the quality of its mechanics and its technical execution make it an absolute joy to play. The challenge of Neutron is much like a classic arcade game, with plenty of waves and power-ups to battle, outwit and collect. Whilst the limitations of the contest do make for some repetitive content, particularly around the bosses, this could really be excused as something to be rewarded for getting through each of its stages as a nice, chilled battle. I am truly, truly happy to see Neutron is planned for an extended release. I really can only imagine just how much it could be turned up to 11 to make something even greater than it already is. 
But so we come to the end of this two part series and another episode of Beyond the Scanlines. Before I close things off, I just really want to express my thanks to RG City for organizing the event and to all the developers who took their time to create new games for us all to enjoy. I'd also like to thank all of you who've taken the time to watch this little sub-series, and hopefully you've been inspired to fire up your C64, or emulator, to check out the great entries submitted. Do tell me what your favourites are, and whether or not how different they were to those that I picked. Most importantly, if you enjoyed the video, would you kindly hit the thumbs up? I know it's annoying to say that all the time, but it really helps it get into the hands of more people. And of course, if you haven't done so, do consider subscribing to the channel. And yes, hitting the bell so you can be notified the moment new videos are published. But with that, thank you all very much for watching.